pleasure to introduce uh, Ben Elias, who is visiting for two weeks. Uh, he's been giving a lecture course, and he's uh, giving this. In addition, he's giving this colloquium and a colloquium next week at CMR. So it's a pleasure. Uh, uh, his uh, affiliation for the moment is MIT. MIT. So, uh, and the, uh, the title, the, it's going to be about diagrammatics. He'll tell us about the exam. Okay. Uh, so thanks very much, Raghavan. Thanks. It's great to be here. I'm really enjoying this trip. So um, today uh, I'm going to talk about categorical group actions of coxeter groups and, and braid groups. So I work in a field called categorical representation theory. So normal representation theory is interested in groups or algebras acting on vector spaces. So categorical representation theory is roughly the same thing. Groups and algebras acting on uh, categories. Or we, there's some sort of linear structure here. So I'll say linear categories. Categories with some sort of direct sum uh, operation, etc. And of course, I'm, I'm lying a little bit. I should really say two groups and two algebras, something like that. But roughly, this is what we're talking about. So what does it mean for a group to act on a category? I'll, I'll, I'll give you the definition. This is well known. What does it mean for an algebra to act on a category? This is something which is a little different. And in fact, already a very interesting question. Uh, so a lot of this field is, is even like defining what it means for an algebra to act on a category in such a way that the categorical representation theory mimics the usual representation theory. Um, but today, we'll stick to groups. And you'll see that there are some interesting implications of this question. So first, I know you all know this, but what does it mean for a group to act on a vector space? OK? So G acting on a vector space, what does this mean? So there's sort of the, uh, can people see if I write down here? Um, there's the uh, definitional version of this, which is that for all G and G, you have a map phi G uh, in the endomorphism ring of V, um, such that for all G and H and G, if you compose phi G with phi H, you get phi G H. This is wonderful, but this is not the definition we ever really use in practice. I mean, it is when you're doing something canonical like GLN acting on its standard representation. But in real life, we don't usually define uh, an action of every element in the group. We use generators and relations to simplify our lives. OK, so the useful definition is that if we have a presentation of G by generators with some relations, okay, then we only need to define for all generators you need phi s and phi s inverse in the endomorphism ring of V, such that for all relations, so a relation is something of the form, you know, s1 to the, plus, you know, maybe plus or minus s3 plus or minus that, 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 is equal to 1. That's what a relation says. Well, then you check that phi s1 to the plus or minus phi s2. So that's what we use in practice. And this is, you know, when, group, when the group G is infinite, this is an infinite amount of work. But when the presentation is finite, this is a finite amount of work. So obviously, this is more useful. Um, the problem is now generalizing this idea of what happens when a group acts on a category. Okay. So what does it mean for a group to act on a category C? So here's the sort of wrong definition. This is too naive. So the naive definition is that for all G and G, you have a functor, Fg, as a functor from C to itself, Okay, an endofunctor. And for all G and H and G, if you compose these functors, and compare it to the functor of the composition, well, functors aren't equal. They're isomorphic. Okay, so these functors should be isomorphic. That would be a naive definition. The problem is that when you're 
in category theory, you don't want two things to be isomorphic. That's not so good. You want them to be canonically isomorphic. Right? And, and what that means in this case, I'll spell out in a sec. Uh, so this definition is too naive, but unfortunately, it's the one that's always used in the literature. When people talk about actions of braid groups and categories, it's almost always a weak action. This is this thing I would call a weak action. Whereas the true one is a strict action, and, and it's almost never checked in the literature. So the real definition, and again, this is the definitional one. So you know, for all G, you have uh, f of G. And for all G and H, you don't just have any isomorphism. You fix the isomorphism. So this is now part of the structure. Is some map alpha G H F G composed with H. And then you need these morphisms themselves to satisfy some sort of, a, uh, some sort of condition. So for all G H and K, if you compose F G with F H and F K, then there's sort of two natural ways that you could get to F, G, H, K, right? You first pair these two, and then that, the result with this, or the second two, it's associative. And the statement is that these two paths are equal. Okay, so this is usually called the associator relation. Okay. So um, the reason that, that the associator relation is so powerful is that it implies compatibility. Or canonicalness compatibility, which is the following statement. Um, so if if you know if you have some word and it's equal to some other word, then you want there to be a canonical isomorphism. You want this to be canonical. So there's many ways by applying these transformations and their inverses and so forth. There's potentially many ways to construct a natural transformation from here to here. But the, associati the associator relation is actually enough to guarantee that they're all equal. So there's just really one. So compatibility is great. This is what we really want. Ah, yeah, yeah. So the question is, if you specify a, a something like this for each wor words that are equal, the just, relations are. Just over there, for every G, H, and H, from that equality, yep. even that could be a, some kind of naturalized. Well, then actually, there's that, that would be in a three category. Huh. And, and it, so it, you know, that would be G acting on a two category. Sorry. Right? In a category, two morphisms are either equal or not equal. Objects are isomorphic, but morphisms are just equal. Right? So there's really nothing else you can do. But if you're interested in G acting on a two category, yes. OK. But now what we're really interested in is something that's a little bit more useful. OK? So if, if our group is given by generators and relations, right, then you know, for all S, you want to define a functor and its inverse. And uh, for all relations, you want to fix um, You want to fix an isomorphism, alpha r, to the identity functor. And then what? No, an equality of morphisms. So this is, this is a morphism, a natural transformation from this guy to this guy. And using him, we can construct two natural transformations. I can write it out. So you know, first you apply alpha gh. Um, tensor with the identity of k. So that gets you to f g h circle k, and then you apply f alpha g h k. Or you do the other thing. First you do these. All right, so alpha h k tensor 1, and then you apply alpha g h k. So these are the two things, and these are both morphisms, natural transformations. You want these to be equal. Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. 
And that will imply sort of an even nicer statement. So over here, if we had a group given by generators and relations, we can use much less data. And we can just define a, an isomorphism for each relation. But the question is, what guarantees compatibility? What relations among relations? <laughs> That is, what relations among these morphisms would one need to guarantee that there's a canonical isomorphism between any two words? So such that something, something, something. So far, the presentation has only given us uh, structure. It hasn't given us the uh, uh, properties. Right? So this is, this is the question that I'm asking. Such that what? What guarantees compatibility? Um, compatibility. So this is the big question. And it's a hard question, and it's too hard to ask in general. Like many questions in representation theory, you know, you don't want to study representations of all algebras, you study representations of, you know, Lie algebras that are complex and semi-simple, or you know, some natural class where the question actually has a reasonable answer. And this question is too hard in general, but one can hope to answer it for reasonable group presentations. So, um, so what would it mean to impose relations among these things? If you had a certain class of relations that you wanted to impose. Excuse me, may, may I ask? Yes, please. Let's take the trivial example of G equals Z mod 2. I was going to do that example. And take S to be the, the non trivial generator. Yep. So what is the relation? I will show you. I'll show you. So w wait about five minutes and we'll get there. Um, so um, the point is that you could write down some kind of word in, in these alpha r's. You could write down some sort of composition of these things and say, OK, this is equal to some other composition. This would, is what we'd call a two relation. Okay, It would be some sort of relation between composition of various alpha r's and their inverses. And I guess actually also, um, you shouldn't just fix this. I forgot to write this down. If F and FS and FS inverse are inverse functors, that's actually a structure, not a property. So you'd actually want to fix there's some morphism from FS, FS inverse to the identity. And there's some morphism back and so forth. And you want to fix all this structure as well. So some composition of things like this and things like that. Um, and a relation between these things would be called a two relation. And so you could talk about a two presentation of a group where you fix some generators and some relations and some two relations. And, and you could talk about sort of actions of such a thing on a category. Okay. So I'll give some examples soon, as I promised. Uh, but first, I want to give an equivalent question, which is nice and topological. So the top, topological equivalent. So when you have a, a presentation of a group, we, we learned this in our first algebraic topology class. This is a recipe for constructing a, a cell complex, a CW complex. Okay? You start with a single zero cell, a point, and you attach a loop for each generator, and then you attach a two cell uh, for each relation. Okay, so one cells are S, and two cells are R. Okay. So um, now pi one of the CW complex, I'll, I'll write x less than or equal to 2, is g. And that's the whole point of this. Okay. And now if you glue in 3 cells and 4 cells and 5 cells, that won't change pi 1. Okay. Um, now, so you know, a path in the 1 skeleton, you know, start here, go this way, then go backwards and go here. This is just a word. Okay, an expression. So this is a, or or you know the composition of the corresponding functors. 
Okay? And so a homotopy should correspond to an isomorphism of functors. Okay? Like, for instance, there's homotopies you can already do in the one skeleton. You know, if you went along S and then backwards along S, you can sort of pull that back. And that's exactly following this natural transformation right here. Whereas if you do the homotopy that sort of goes across R, that would be applying that natural transformation there. Okay? So a, a homotopy is an isomorphism of functors. And what we want is all homotopies to be equal. That is, there's no homo all homotopies should be homotopic. Okay? So we want all homotopies homotopic. Right? In other words, uh, we want pi 2 of x to be trivial. Okay, so what we're really asking is a question about pi 2, not pi 1. Well, pi 2 of a, of, a, of a complex like this is usually not trivial. What you can do to make it trivial is glue in some, some three cells. Okay, so these three cells that you glue in are exactly the, the two relations. And if you find what pi 2 of this space is, find generators for it and glue in three cells for each, that's exactly the same as solving this question. So what we're interested in is what is pi 2 of x2? If we can find generators for this, then we'll know exactly what two relations to impose. So you know, maybe I should say there are some general two relations we can impose that correspond to homotopies taking place within x2 itself. Okay. What we're interested in, or in addition, what are the homotopies that we need to glue in? What are the three cells that we need to, to, to glue in that will kill what remains? So general relations and then special relations. So now I'll give the example that you asked for. So when g is generated by a single element with s squared, is the identity, right? This is z mod 2z. And the corresponding complex is, well, we take a point, we glue in a single generator s, and then we glue in this two cell twice, uh, wrapped around twice. So this is just rp2. And we know that pi2 of rp2 is z generated by, well, the class of this two cell. And so if we glue in a three cell, killing that, then we'd be done. OK, so we need, to, we need some three cell. And we know even how to glue it in. OK, and I will tell you what the corresponding um, relation is here once I uh, develop some diagrams, which will make it easier to draw this stuff. Okay. So that's the topological version. And now, before I get to sort of the diagrammatic version, I want to give, an, give the example that I care about. So, you know, we're interested not just in groups, we're really interested in groups with presentations. So the example that I care about is a class of groups with the kind of presentation that they have. So a Coxeter group. is a group, W, generated by a set of involutions, so s squared is 1, and such that um, for all s. And then for all pairs of elements, there's some sort of braid relation between them. So how this looks is that s, t, s, t, dot, 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 this alternating sequence is equal to the sequence of the same length. So there's some length, n, s, t. And we see that STST dot 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 is equal to TSTS dot dot dot. So as an example, I'll just give you know the, the familiar example, the symmetric group on n letters is an example of a Coxeter group. So it's generated by these things SI, which are adjacent transpositions, switching the place of the i entry and the i plus first entry. And the relations are, well, this is an involution, obviously. And if you, if you take i and i plus 1 and then j and j plus 1 and they're far apart, then these things commute. 
So si sj is equal to sj si when i minus j is at least 2. So this is the example when m is 2. And then si si plus 1, si is si plus 1, si si plus 1. And this is the example m is 3. OK. So now you've seen a couple of examples of what things look like. m is also allowed to be infinity, in which case you omit the relation. So this is a coxeter group. Now, what kind of actions of this am I interested in? Well, most of them are built out of the following situation. W acts on some polynomial ring. So W has a, a, a reflection representation. This is a standard thing. And if you take the coordinate ring of this vector space, you have a polynomial ring, and it acts on this as well. So the example is Sn acts on polynomials and n variables. Very nice and straightforward. Okay. And what you can do, given this, is you can let r sub w be the r by module. Okay. So why r by module? An r by module, tensoring with it, gives you a functor from r modules to r modules. So you can think of this thing as a functor as well. So let r w be the r by module, which is isomorphic to r as a left module, so as a vector space, it's just polynomials. But you twist the right action by w. So m dot f, if f is a polynomial, uh, is just wf times m. So this, this thing is called a, a standard module in some contexts. This workshop that I'm running, we're talking about other things that you could do with this action of W on R. So this is a very simple thing you can do. And it, it's pretty easy to observe that our W tensor RV is isomorphic to R W V. I mean, if you have a polynomial on the right and you want to get it all the way to the left, this is tensor over R. That's the action of W on this polynomial. Um, so you're allowed to multiply this thing on the right and on the left, and these actions are different. Right, the action on the left is just with G. Oh, it's, R is a commutative ring. This is the polynomial ring. Um, good. So it's fairly easy to see that there's an isomorphism like this. But it's also easy to see that you can fix this isomorphism canonically. I mean, there's an element in here, 1 tensor 1. And if you just send it to the element 1, then this whole system of isomorphisms is, is satisfies compatibility. So this is a categorical action. This is W acting on the category of R modules. In the, in the strong sense that I was saying before. And even in the, in the definition one, the easy definition where we know things. Okay? So this is pretty boring. Okay? This is, this is nothing very exciting. Um, yes? Yeah. Oh, I sh what do you mean? Uh, uh, category yeah, to each element of W, I associate a functor, which is tensoring with RW. Right? And so that, that says what the action. And so I didn't use generators and relations at all for this. And I will later. I'm going to ask the question, what if you view this as being generated just by RS? What relations do you have to impose? So we'll get to that in a sec. Um, but you know, this is an example where the action of every element of W is easy, which kind of makes it trivial. You could just use the first definition. But I want to give you an example where that doesn't happen. So the braid group of a Coxeter group has the same start of the presentation. It has these braid relations, but it doesn't have the quadratic relation. S squared is not one. This is the definition of a braid group of a Coxeter group. Usually, actually, instead of writing it S, you write it TS. Don't ask me why they do that. There it is. So you should put these here to distinguish it from the original. 
So you know, the point is that TS is not the same thing as TS inverse. So now I'm going to give you a yes. Um, well, but that, that's I, by this I mean the general braid relations. That is for any for all ST and all M. So this is an example of a braid relation. People call this the braid relation because it's silly. This is also a braid relation. OK, so how do we make a categorical action out of this? I'm going to let BS be the following R by module. So you take pairs of polynomials where anything that's invariant under this simple reflection goes across. OK? This is a perfectly uh, nice. R by module, and it has a multiplication map back to R. So this is a complex of R by modules. So tensoring with a complex gives you a functor on the derived category of R by modules. Okay. Now this actually, yeah, this is a two-term complex. All right, and it turns out. So um, uh, let's see. You know, what is the kernel of this map? Okay, so the kernel of this map is generated by things of the form, well, in, um, in the example that I gave over there, it's generated of things of the form xi tensor 1 minus 1 tensor xi. It's generated by this. So clearly, clearly when you multiply these, you both get xi, so you get 0. And these actually generated. Okay, so this uh, is, you know, cs minus all this. And CS minus satisfies the condition that if you act on the right on CS minus, it's the same thing as acting by S of F on the left. So in fact, um, uh, CS, right? So this, this I is associated to S. Sorry. There's a connection between this. This is a single element that I'm generated by. So the point is that this kernel is actually isomorphic to RS. So there's a quasi-isomorphism between this functor and uh, the, the, you know, this complex and the complex which just has Rs in degree 0. But there's no homotopy equivalent. So there's a map in one direction, but not, there's a map in this direction, but not a map in that direction. So this is a, this is a homotopy equivalent, but uh, this is an, a quasi-isomorphism, but not a homotopy equivalent. Um, Sorry, say that again. Yes, uh, SI is what I mentioned. In, in, this, in, in the example of SM. And in general, it's alpha S tensor 1 minus 1 tensor alpha S. That will also work. So, um, so what's the point? Uh, the point is that sending TS to tensoring with this complex actually is a categorical action. Gives a categorical action of the braid group on uh, the homotopy category of R by modules, of R modules. And if you descend to um, to the derived category, then it actually factors through W because you can just replace this complex with this easy complex where you know how things work. Okay, so then it descends from this previous example. But on the, on the homotopy category, it's genuinely just a, cat a categorical action of the braid group. TS, the complex associated to this, and TS inverse are not, hom not homotopy equivalent. They're just quasi-isomorphic. OK, so this is an example where I gave it to you in terms of the generators. And if you want to write down what complex corresponds to an arbitrary element of the braid group, it's quite difficult. It's very difficult. And so this is a situation. This, this you know, right now, this is not a strict categorical action. I've just given you a weak categorical action. I'm claiming to you that it's strict. Uh, and this, this action underlies all the actions of braid groups that you've ever heard of. 
uh, almost every action to break each you ever heard of. Twists by spherical functors, um, uh, shuffling and twisting functors in category, uh, you name it. Almost every categorical action of the braid group actually comes from this example. So this is the kind of thing that I was interested in studying. And the tool for studying these things and for trying to make it strict are uh, reduced expression methods. Yes? Uh, left. Tensor on the left side. It doesn't, you know, make your choice. <laughs> your choice. I mean, it, you're, you're tensoring with an R module, so you have to tensor on the left. Okay. So the tool to study this stuff are reduced expression graphs. So this is kind of nice. So if you have an element uh, of your of your Coxer group, so like the symmetric group, say, then you can write it in, as, a, as a word in the simple reflections. And when this is minimal length, this is called a reduced expression. When d is minimal. And since this word gets used a lot, I'm going to write rex instead of reduced expression. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, so just the, the general awareness that complexes of bimodules give you functors on the homotopy category. This is, this is a fact. It's, it's not immediately obvious. You, you know that you can take a module to a complex, but you don't know that you can take a complex to another complex. You take the total complex, it's... Okay. Um, so here we are. So. You know, the fact is that any two expressions are related by the relations in the cox group. S squared is 1 and the braid relation. And I already erased those, unfortunately. But any two reduced expressions are only connected by the braid relations. OK? Two rexes for the same element are related by a sequence of braid relations. So let me give you an example. So there's the so-called longest element of S4, which is the thing that switches 1 and, two, one and 4 and 2 and 3 in S4. OK? So here is a reduced expression for it. S1, S2, S1, S3, S2, S1. OK? You, pro you don't have to write down this thing you know, if you're taking notes. But uh, keep track of the structure of this thing. So there's a couple of braid relations we can apply to this. These two commute. So that's a braid relation. So this is S3, S1, S2, S1. And then the other thing we can do is here we have an S1, S2, S1, which can be switched with an S2, S1, S2. This is the m equals 3 version. So this becomes S2, S1, S2, S3, S2, S1. And we could have done the same thing over here with this guy. And we get something. Okay. Well, over here, we can just now do 2, 3, 2, and we get something. And then there's a bunch of stuff we can do. So I'm going to finish drawing this graph of all the reduced expressions and all the ways they're connected. Oh, shoot. This one. I, I drew this too big, unfortunately, up here. So why don't I make this so that it looks nice and symmetric, because it's symmetric. There. So every vertex is a reduced expression. Every edge is a braid relation. And these are all the braid relations that can be applied. So this is called a reduced expression graph. The double edges correspond to when MST is 2. It's when two things commute. The single edges are when MST is 3. OK. So here's this graph. What's the point of drawing this graph? All right. Well, for any vertex on the graph, we have a functor. Right? You take FS1 followed by FS2 followed by FS1. And any edge on this graph is one of our natural isomorphisms. That's part of the built-in definition in this purported definition of a categorical action. Okay, 
So to any path, so so uh, vertex gives a functor uh, an edge, and therefore a path gives a natural transformation. Okay, and you know so for instance, if we take the path which follows this edge and goes back, this little loop right there then the fact that this going this way and going this way were inverse isomorphisms, say that this path is equal to the path that just stands still, to the identity path. Okay? So this is a relation that we already have amongst the natural transformations given by paths. However, nothing a priori says that if we start here and take a path that goes around in a circle, that this should be the identity natural transformation. It's some natural transformation. Who knows what it is? Okay? But if we have a categorical action in the strict sense, then there should be a canonical isomorphism between any two things. So whatever this loop is, it should be the identity morphism. Okay? So the point is that cycles in this graph should be covered by the two relations. That is, there better be a two relation which says that if we follow a cycle in this graph, then we get the identity morphs. OK? So you can see that there's sort of two kinds of cycles in this graph. There's the big one, which is the interesting one. And then there's these stupid little small ones. Okay, I'm just going to quickly zoom in on these stupid little small ones here. What this thing is, is it's S2, S1, S3. S2, S, S3, S1. And you, what you should be looking at is you've got S1 and S3 here that commute, and you've got S1 and S3 here that commute. And so we can switch this and switch that. And when we switch both of them, we're over here. Okay? But, you know, this path is doing this one first and then this one. This path is doing this one first and then that one. But these two are far away from each other. So okay. in, in, our, in our category, in our natural transformations, it's like applying a natural transformation here and a natural transformation here. And these things automatically commute. This is you know, one of the rules of, in a category. You know, if you take compositions of functors, you apply a natural transformation to part of it and a natural transformation. These commute. So this is true in any minoidal category. Okay? So this kind, of, this kind of thing where you have disjoint applications of braid relations will give you a square. Do one first and then the other, or, or the other. This is called a disjoint square. And you don't need any two relations to take care of that. That just follows from the laws of, of monoidal categories and two categories, natural transformations. So these are totally OK. But there's this interesting cycle, which is going all the way around. And that is not OK. There is nothing a priori that gives it to you. So in this case, the fact that the path from here to here and the path from here to here are equal is, has a name in math. It's already, been, it's already showed up in places. It's called the Zamologikov equation. If you remember how to write that, then you're better than me. I think I got it right. So this is called the Zamologikov equation. And this is, this is for this specific example. Okay. And the Zamologikov equation is this three cell that we need to glue in. Okay, this is one of our, our two relations. Okay. Cool. So, um, so there's an old theorem. I don't really know who this is due to. It has to do with the topology of the Cockfitter complex, and I can't get to that soon. That all cycles in reduced expression graphs in all reduced expression graphs for any element in any coxin are generated by disjoint cycles and uh, disjoint squares. Sorry, that's what I was wondering. Disjoint squares. And uh, 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 the cycle appearing for the longest elements, for the 
element with, who has the longest reduced expression. There's a unique one. In uh, a finite rank 3 coxeter group. We don't know what this is. It's not a big deal. OK, so S4, or type A3, is the example of a finite rank 3 coxeter group. There's infinite rank 3 coxeter groups. They don't have longest elements. Their lengths go on to infinity. So we're not talking about those. But there is a cycle. So these are classified. There's a classification of finite rank 3 coxeter groups. They're of type A1 cross A1 cross A1. So if you know what this means, that's OK. And if you don't, that's not a big deal. A1 cross the dihedral group, A3, B3, and H3. These, there's only five of them. Okay? And each of these has, if you look at its reduced expression graph and you ignore the disjoint squares, it's just a circle. Just like this. And so you have these generalized Zamolodzikovs, one for each of these. Okay? These give generalized uh, Zamolodzikovs, or Zams, because no one wants to write that out. That's right. For any finite coxeter group, there is a unique longest element. And we only care about the finite coxeter groups with three generators. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no preferred starting point. There is in type A, but that's a totally different story. In type A, actually, these reduced expression graphs have an orientation, a canonical orientation. OK? We're actually, it's actually oriented from top to bottom. Oh, it wasn't an accident. But this is, this is a theorem of Menin and Schechtman, but this is not at all generalized. Of it. OK, so the theorem that's roughly a consequence of this, due to myself and Jordy Williamson, is that besides the general relations, general two relations, so in other words, the things that hold for all group um, presentations, with the homotopies within the two skeleton. So there's some general relations, but then besides those, the only rule, the only two relations you need you need uh, to impose for W for a, a categorical action of a coxeter group are the Zomologikovs and something in type A1. So type A1 is exactly the Z-mod 2Z example that I just talked about. And as I said, there's some uh, RP2s. There's an RP2 that shows up for every generator, and you have to kill the pi 2 coming from that. And there's a couple other RP2s that come, you know, and something. So there's some really boring things. There's a similar thing that shows up for every dihedral group that shows up inside every pair. Once you kill these stupid things, all that remains are the zomology type equations. And once you impose those, you're done. Okay. So it's basically what we're saying is you have this two presentation. You have this you know, this normal uh, generators and relations description of the coxeter group. We know what pi two of that topological space is. Okay. Now for the braid group. Conjecturally, you have the same theorem. So in other words, you don't have this stuff going on, these RP2s, because you don't have the relation S squared is 1. But you do have Zamologikov relations, and these should be enough. Yes. But the point is that you know, for any Coxeter group, rank 500, any element in there, some ginormous reduced expression graph, but each one of this graph, you know, all the cycles are generated by just the ones that show up for little things inside it. No, no, no. So, so for every reflection, so there's something for each S. And something for each pair, st. There's some stupid little things like rp1s inside that you have to take care of. But aside from that, so uh, yeah. And a quick idea 
of the this this the proof of this is topological. There's so for W. Uh, there's something called the Co the Coxeter complex, and we use a variant of it, but a new variant that no one has really played with before. And uh, for the braid group, for the braid group, it's it's actually known what this corresponding um, what this corresponding uh, to what this corresponding cell complex is. It's something called the Salvetti complex. The Salvetti complex is not just a three-dimensional cell complex, but all the way up to infinity. And this is supposed to be, so it's called the Salvetti complex. And this is, there's a big conjecture called the k pi 1 conjecture, which says that the Salvetti complex is uh, the classifying space of the braid group. Or in other words, it's, it's uh, k braid group 1. In other words, pi 1 is the braid group, and all other homotopy groups are trivial. So this is a very big conjecture in topology. And um, all that we care about is that pi 2 of this complex is trivial. <laughs> right, so maybe that's, that's a much simpler statement, the k pi 1 conjecture at. But there's, there's hope that this can be proven in an elementary diagrammatic way soon. So in the time remaining, I wanted to introduce to you how you address this question with diagrams. Yeah, no, you would have proved the theorem. Exactly. They're equivalent. Okay. So diagrams. So what we're really dealing are with are functors and natural transformations between functors. And there's a natural language for describing these things, which is planar diagrams. So I don't want to go into it in too much detail. But I'll give you an easy example just to give the idea. Okay? So if, you know, for the original setup, original definition, where for every group you have, element of the group you have a functor, and for every pair you have a natural transformation, then we would draw the functor, fg, as just a point on the line labeled by g. And so we would draw a composition, fg1, fg2, fg3, as three points on a line, g1, g2, g3. Okay, so composition is horizontal concatenation. We would draw the natural transformation, you know, alpha gh. This was a map from fg composed fh to fgh. And I would draw this as a rectangle, where the bottom of the rectangle is gh. And the top of the rectangle is the, the product. And I would draw this thing as some symbol in this rectangle. So I would just maybe make it look like this. Maybe I'll put a little box around it. Some little, some little machine that takes two inputs and produces one output. Well, I read things from bottom to top, and in this case, from left to right. I'm sorry, but the earlier lecture where I jumped. Um, so what does associativity look like? The associator relation. And this language is exactly as follows. We're comparing two maps from GHK to the product GHK. And in one of these maps, first we're combining G and H into GH, and then combining that with K. Okay, so each of these should be labeled you know, alpha GH, alpha GHK. Right, and so like you can see here that we're doing alpha GH tensored with the identity map of K, just like from before. That's how these pointer diagrams work. And this is supposed to be equal to the other way of doing it. Okay. And the claim, you know, that's built into this definition is that um, is that all crazy, all crazy diagrams that you can construct out of this basic building block are in fact equal. But this is something that should be familiar to you from your gut. 
is just like saying that associativity, the associativity relation in a group, is enough to say that all expressions, it doesn't matter how you, you have an expression of length 15, it doesn't matter how you compose them. That's uh, all you need is associativity to guarantee that. That's basically the, the statement here. So um, I'll give you um, another example. Yes, I think I have just enough time to do this, which is perfect. For a general G S R, what you want to do is as follows. You have an up arrow labeled S, and this indicates the functor FS. And a down arrow labeled S indicates the functor FS inverse. Which means that the isomorphisms FS composed with FS inverse to the identity looks something like this. And this rectangle is a map from uh, FS, FS inverse, to nothingness, which is the identity. F of the identity. Okay. So, um, so we have this map, and we also have other maps corresponding to various things, the various other maps you can construct, isomorphisms. And the statement that, say, going from here to the identity and going back, um, which is this guy, is uh, that their inverse isomorphisms corresponds to the relation that if you go here and then back, that this is supposed to be the same thing as the identity map of FS, FS inverse. So you have some sort of diagrammatic relation like this, corresponding to the algebraic relation they have. And we have another relation which says that they're inverse maps in the other direction. So it says that the circle corresponds to the empty diagram which is the identity map of the identity functor. Okay, so these are examples of these general relations that you have for any group and for any, any uh, presentation. Okay? You also have relations. So, you know, suppose that S, T, V inverse S was one. Suppose this was one of your relations. Then you want to add some natural transformation from here to the identity. So you take S, T, by, oh, where's the different colors? Ah, it's not worth it. S, T, V inverse S. And you have some sort of symbol. Great. So I'm putting a little tag on this. Perfect. So this is the symbol is, is representing the natural isomorphism that you chose. And you also have the map in the other direction, which you can also view as the orientation inverse of this one. So it's like looking at it from the back side. Okay? So from the back side, you actually have S inverse over here, and then T inverse, and then V, and then S inverse which is also supposed to be the identity. Okay? So you have this opposite version, and there's some relation that says that when you glue these things together, some R and some R inverse, uh, sort of in sort of the natural way, something like that, and the tags are in the same place, then this is supposed to be inverse isomorphisms. So this is supposed to cancel out. Okay. So I just giving you the general thing so that I can show you, uh, for the case of uh, RP2, for Z mod 2Z, what, the, um, what this relation looks like. So for Z mod 2Z, you have this relation S squared is 1. So this is some symbol that takes two upward oriented strands and annihilates them. Okay? And you also have the opposite symbol, which takes two downward oriented strands and annihilates them. Okay? And if you connect these up, plus to minus, uh, no, they go into the plus and out of the minus. So if you connect them up like this, 
and the tags agree, then this thing disappears. So this thing right here corresponds to actually a map from S2 into this two skeleton, into RP2. But it's a map which is homotopically trivial within the two skeleton, within RP2. But, but, if you do the same sort of picture, except that the tags don't match up, this gives you another map from S2 into RP2. And this is the one that doesn't cancel. So there's no way to make this disappear. Okay? So this thing is not is not trivial. And so in fact, imposing this as a relation among diagrams is exactly the relation you need to impose to kill pi 2. So this is the new relation. The new relation is, to, is actually force and equality. Okay? So that's an example of this. And once you've imposed this relation, you can, you know, when everything's generated by involutions, like in a coxeter group, you can ignore orientations. So this thing gives you a natural isomorphism between uh, S and S inverse. So you no longer track of the isom of the uh, of the orientations once you impose that relation there. And so just to to you know simplify a bunch of things for W, what do we do? So our, our generators are these, uh, is S, and we have S squared is 1, and we have the braid relations. So suppose that we've already taken care of the S squared is 1 by gluing this in, and that allows us to ignore orientations. So that means that we have maps like this. Sort of I've gotten rid of the orientations, I've gotten rid of the little boxes, everything is nice and easy. So this is the map from s squared to 1 and the map from 1 to s squared. But then we also have braid relations. So you know, if su is equal to us, then you have some picture that looks like this. Okay? This is some map from su to us. And you just draw it like this. We should be keeping track of a tag somewhere, but like I said, um, uh, there's some relations that you can impose that allow you to forget those tags as well. So this is, these are the other relations I was talking about. For STS equals TST, it would look something like this. There is your map from STS to TST. And so I wanted to draw for you uh, uh, some of the relations. Right, so we have the sort of general relations that we've seen before, that if you take a circle, it disappears. And, and things of that nature. You have some sort of statement that you can do isotopy of diagrams, that you can pull diagrams straight. Okay. You have statements that these things are isomorphisms, so that if you do one, and then go back, that this is, I really should have used different colors and red and orange are so similar. And that's the same thing as doing the identity map. But then you have, so these are sort of the general relations. But then you have the interesting relations, the Zomologikov relations. And I'll draw one of them for you, or I'll maybe draw a couple of them for you because they're pretty. So now I need at least, now I need three colors. So for A1 cross A1 cross A1, where you have three things that commute, then any pair can have a crossing like this. And so you can draw a diagram like this. That's a map from, this is the longest element of a1 cross a1 cross a1 to another reduced expression. And here's another, the other path in the reduced expression graph. And these are supposed to be equal. That's an example of a Zomologikov. It's, it's one that looks familiar to, to many people. It looks like a, a Rennemeister. But then, if in like, for instance, in a1 cross a2, so you've got two colors that have MST as 3. And you've got a third color that can cross over them. 
So there's two pictures I can draw. And these are supposed to be equal. There here are some Zamologikovs. But here's the fun one, A3. Here's the Zamologikov. And there's one for B3 and H3 as well. Supposedly, one should be able to use this, these relations to take any diagram and reduce it to the empty diagram. And if we could do that, we could find a diagrammatic proof of this theorem. But it's quite difficult, and I don't have one. OK, so there it is. Sorry for going over. Kind of like a dynamite stream. Yes. It's kind of like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's it's it's. Randomizer says that you can pull one strand across a crossing. This is a more complicated kind of crossing. You can pull a strand across that complicated kind of crossing too. This is also. This is not pulling a strand across a crossing. This is something very different, because you don't have anything that commutes with other stuff. So. It's quite different. 